Today we embark on the fourth chapter of this course. In the first one we learned all about functions. In the second we learned about data and how it can be represented as objects and given behavior. We've just finished the third chapter on how interpreters work, which hopefully gave you new perspective on how programming languages are structured, how they get interpreted, and how you can build your own. Most of these things we've used examples that had to do with just the internals of the computer, manipulating small amounts of input. Data processing is a different idea, where now we're going to think about how to get your computer to interact with large amounts of input, which might be coming from another computer or from some source in the world. So there are new ideas that come up when we think about data processing, which is really the central activity of most computing applications today. So we're going to focus first on processing sequential data. So many data sets, though they may be very large, can be processed or considered sequentially. So if we want to go through and look at the set of all Twitter posts that have ever been made, looking for particular characteristics, well, we could start at the beginning of when Twitter was created and work our way up until the real time. With an election, the votes cast can be considered in order as we're tallying them up for each candidate. As an airplane flies through the air, we could consider its sensor readings as being organized through time. And the positive integers have a natural ordering as well. So these are all large data sets that have some sequential ordering. So if we want to do some computation on them, we might consider the elements in order. However, we developed a sequence interface back in chapter two. And that sequence interface actually doesn't apply to many of these examples. So the two properties of a sequence interface were that a sequence had a finite known length and that a sequence representation should allow arbitrary element selection for any element. Well, that just doesn't work. There are infinitely many positive integers, so that doesn't have a finite known length. With a set of all Twitter posts, I can go right now and look at the ones that are being tweeted right now, but I actually can't go back to the beginning of the Twitter stream and see what happened back then. That information just isn't accessible to me. I have to process it as it's being broadcast to the world. So there's no way that I can perform element selection to find the 872nd Twitter post that was ever made, unless I did a lot of work to collect all that data, which I didn't. So that data is gone to me. And yet I can still talk about processing that sequential data. So we're going to think about new ways of viewing sequential data. That's not just with the sequence interface, but instead allows us to represent large, possibly unbounded, possibly infinite collections of elements and how to run algorithms over them. So here are some important ideas in this realm of big data processing. The first is that we're going to need implicit representations of streams of sequential data. What that means is, we're not going to have the entire data set available as one data structure that we have explicitly represented in the computer's memory. There is no way that any good computer could, for instance, hold the entire World Wide Web in its memory. It can only hold a small piece. So we need some implicit representation that allows us to access elements, but doesn't store them all. And that will be today and the next lecture. Next, We'll look at declarative programming languages, which is a programming language paradigm where you state what you want and it's up to the computer to figure out how to compute it for you. And these declarative programming languages are typically used in order to do data processing. They take some pool of data and comp perform computation over it in a way that um, is determined by what data you want out or what analysis you want out without you necessarily having to code up all the little bits of how you compute that information. Okay, so we'll learn about that for a couple of days. And we need to learn about distributed and parallel processing. So uh, distributed computing means that you have multiple different computers all working on the same application together. 
And parallel computing means that you have separate threads of processing that might be on the same computer or different computers that are doing work simultaneously in order to achieve a common goal. Now we'll talk about distributed computing in this class. We're not going to talk much about parallel computing, although there is a section in the textbook that's about parallel computing. So if you're interested, go forth and read ahead. You can learn all about it in chapter four.